Rich Berg is a poet, performer, and educator. And currently, he is the producer and co-host for The Love of Words that is filmed at the Easton Community Cable Station. He is also co-instructor of the poetry workshops at the Ames Free Library in Easton, Massachusetts. Rich also was a two-time semi-finalist at the Providence Poetry Slam and co-created and co-hosted a youth poetry slam and open mic at Massasoit College. As a brain injury survivor and advocate for the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts, Rich speaks to organizations about prevention, legislation, and the effects of brain injury on survivors and their families. And his first book of poetry, Tough Guys Cry, is due to be published in the spring of this year, 2016. And today, Rich has also brought a gift uh, in thanks to the community here, as he indicated to me, of a uh, preview of some of his poems uh, booklet for all of you here. So with that and gratitude for the gift of poetry that he brings uh, in his book and in his self, please welcome Rich Berg. My first piece is creation. In the beginning, there was music in the cosmos. Then, in a celestial celebration, the notes created humans so they could enjoy the music and bestowed upon them the greatest of all gifts, the power of creative expression. <clears throat> the artist is born. This is no ordinary power, cradling heartstrings and feelings of sometimes displaced emotional spaces and places maybe we'd rather leave alone. When the artist feels the power, I mean really feels the power, all universal and invincible, a familiar dance of sparkling symbolism. It's the holy and moly, the good and golly Miss Molly. It's a download, a ringtone, an MP3, an album, or an old CD. The blues made to Tom and rapper girl Joe, or a quick little ditty from a Broadway show. It's that song buzzing round and round in your head. A jingle, a jangle, a melody, and everything from your MTV. It's the hip and the hippie, the flapper and the rapper, the barroom, the bedroom, and of course the morning after. It's the soul of soul that makes you crave that groove and that ooh when you find your move. Oh, it's problematic, emphatic, and full of innuendo. Iconic, moronic, with blistering bravado. Those parables and prophets of mystical flight. For these are the things that go bump in the night of sonnets and allegory and psalms that don't rhyme, of metaphor and imagery in verse and sublime. Everybody rocks and everybody rolls and everyone's got a story to tell. And in this day, this modern day, music, sweet, beautiful music, tells our story oh so well. So sing us a song, sing it loud and strong or peacefully as you drift off to sleep. Back to that place where our giggles giggled and our riddles riddled or tears rolled down our face. Tucked away not for long, brought back in a song, these memories we shall forever keep. <clears throat> we will switch gears here. <clears throat> 21 guns under the red, white, and blue. <clears throat> Airborne ICU breathing you. 20 units stopped the bleeding. Diminished pulse, another transfusion. Chopper spinning into confusion. No movie magic, no illusion. No take two in a combat rescue. Night sky, pop. No confirmation, no communication. Descent, 400 feet, 200 feet, minus 100, sir. Morphine drip, slip, trip, and holler. Displaced IV and cervical collar failing lung and lacerated face, another marker in the death race. Smackdown into base camp perimeter, shattered glass, rotor bent, cut fuel line, shrapnel punctured leg and gut, sedate, 
cut, clamp, amputate. Soldier dies, close eyes, we cry. The Army, Navy, and Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, and Reserve Companies keep it over there, not here. The velocity atrocity, every time someone dies, even enemy eyes, they cry. Take it home in their heart and die a little too. Don't like it, despise it, must be another way. But until then, time and again, they are the heroes defending our freedom from start to the end. When does it become peace? and democracy in what generation? I'm sorry anyone has to be at war. More sorry, some don't come home. You get the call, a parent's nightmare, realizing your soldier child became an angel, living a dedication beyond words. I'm the mother of, the father of, the sister and the brother of, the son, the daughter, the grandparent of, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the best friend of, the teacher, and the officer of. These soldier children are our future veterans. Save the economy and bail out Wall Street. Play the lobbyist and screw Main Street. But don't ever consider letting a vet worry about housing, health care, or enough to eat. 21 guns under the red, white, and blue. His boots came home alone. Both hands cold his tags I hold, both hands cold, his flag I fold, both hands cold. One more year, he'll never be that old. Thank you. Life is full of interruptions, and as Cheryl mentioned, I'm a multiple trauma and brain injury survivor, and <coughs> that was a small interruption, <coughs> and this next poem is part of a small interruption. <coughs> a Father's Journey. You negligent, pathetic excuse of a mother, you are no woman and no lady. I never said those things, though I had every reason to. They were painfully true. I had more important things to do. I had a seven-year-old. Parenting has always been the most important job I will ever do. After the crying and more crying, the couch kicking tantrums and the sleepless nights, after the dad, can you pick me up early? The dad, can you pick me up soon? The dad, can you pick me up for the last time? The dad, you have no idea what it's like to be the child of divorce and with a mother like her. After 13 years of hugging him, I cradled his face in my hands and gently replied, Son, and you have no idea what it's like to be the father of the child of divorce and with a mother like her, and I hope you never will. After we've been punched and kicked and spat on, maligned, manipulated, and mistreated, when we are seemingly at our worst, we are unknowingly at our best. These are our defining moments. That little boy taught me a very valuable lesson that day. And over time, I found myself a real good woman. Three more children to love, and a mother that loves him as her own. <clears throat> And this, well, most of my poems take me a long time to put together, weeks, months, some of them are years. This took just about two minutes. <laughs> this goes with the back end of a father's journey. <clears throat> it's called Dishes. The dishes are still in the sink. I hate when things are a mess. But tonight, like many other nights, 
I'll go upstairs and lie down next to my wife. And with the light of the moon or the street, I'll look at her aging face and her graying hair and think how crazy in love with her I still am. And that's enough to warm any man's heart on this cold January or any. And I am so grateful to have her here in the audience. She does not like attention, but my Cindy is here in the audience. I love when she comes. Thank you. I have two more poems left. I could go on forever, but I have two more poems left, but before I do, it is critically important for me to say thank you. Thank you to the people here at Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. You have become my home. And um, the gift Cheryl mentioned is a booklet of poems. Some are in my book that's coming out, some are not. It's on the back table. That's my way of saying thank you. Um, thank you to the folks at HCAM who do a wonderful job to Dan Tappan for his beautiful photography, and to our delightful host, Cheryl. And as a host, I can tell you, it is tireless. It is a lot of work, but she makes it look so easy. When I mature, I want to be like her. <laughs> Rich rap. Caution. When I'm flash, rap in front, talking shop shooting. No remix clip or lyric trick. Front stroke, back stroke, side stroke, no joke. Serious to delirious, I am busting loose. Rich rapping, the anti discriminator, the culture barrier breaker rehabilitator. We come from tough times, broken homes, and too much alone. <clears throat> Seeking thrills with booze and pills and getting stoned. We speak with despicable language, but never lose sight of our children. We lyricize indignant attitude while teaching the world how to freestyle, how to get real low, how to shake that mind into a planetary orbit better than any university degree you ever had. We are the multisyllabic, rhythmically significant, critical bit of wit that does more for race relations than any act of Congress. So leave it at the door and shut it as we genuflect and show you how to hammer the hammer that makes the it, the it, the it worth the it to spit. Because it is what it is, except when it isn't what it is, was never what it was. Now, what it was is what it is because we redefined what it is that made it what it was and set it straight. <clears throat> so that black boys and white girls and white girls and black girls and black girls and white boys and everybody in between wouldn't be wrong to respect each other. And so, we'll have ourselves a big old soiree at the cafe. We'll eat to this, drink to that, chit and chat, and, spell, and fill the nights with open mics and rhyme and tide, inspired by your beautiful poetic voices. We'll all be hugging and sighing and saying goodbye. And when we're done, we'll be laughing, and we'll all be hugging and sighing and spilling out emotion all over the place. And when we're done, we'll be hu hugging and saying goodbye. But before we do, Promise me, you'll give these words the good home that they deserve so they can grow up strong and proud. Role models for future generations. <clears throat> and my final piece, unknowingly when I wrote it, this song, the song, this poem, which is almost a song, um, is loved by everybody. I didn't know it was going to be so good when I wrote it. I can't believe I wrote it, but I did, and it's in me. <clears throat> America without poetry. <clears throat> African rhythms couldn't soothe the aching soul of our nation. Motown would have no sound, no slap and rap or hip and hop, no rock and roll or country roads, no pizzazz and jazz or old folk tales, no being blues or innocence to lose, no piano man on 52nd Street born to run on a midnight train to Georgia on my mind to leave the past behind, no sentimental journey to leave your heart in San Francisco 
or be walking after midnight somewhere over the rainbow. No cats, no cradles, no silver spoon, no fly me to the moon or wedding songs in June. In fact, no, my dearest, anything. An American in Paris would be a novelty. Snoop Dogg would have no iced tea. Stones would never roll across the sea. And the boys on the beach would still be sitting on the dock of the bay with Abbey Road so far away. No four score in years ago, the stars and stripes would have no glow. No purple mountains, majesty, or redwood forests for you and me. The statue would be silent on liberty. With no bell being heard across the land, the canyon wouldn't be so grand. No, I have a dream passing a torch to be found by the man in the mirror singing of a new world order, while the rest of us are still walking eight miles in the shoes of the other M guy. Without the thrill of anticipation for the declaration, Ali was the greatest. We'd never have respect for the heroes like him, willing to give peace a chance. We'd be gone without the answers blowing in the wind, running on empty. Stone cold without feeling, and never have understood sexual healing, if not for Barry White and Marvin Gaye. And thanks to John Paul George and Ringo as a group, and of course solo. Thanks to Aretha Reber and Queen Latifah, B.B. Carroll and the King, Carly, Mr. Simon, J.T. and Bing, Diana, Sir Elton, Jackson and Sting, Ella Frank, Muddy and Ray, Mr. <coughs> Dillon, Mr. Orbison, Joni, Smokey and MJ. You've given us this great form of art to challenge, inspire and console our heart. Your words reign forever true for this, your poetry. Our nation will always, always love you. Thank you. And I can't say it enough. Thank you to Cheryl for her tireless work to make this the premier venue. Thank you. program involving poets <coughs> and songwriters. Uh, so this is a chance to, for you to interview the interviewer. I'm always asking them about this stuff, but ask anything. A um, few questions. We, um, so uh, perhaps, oh, there we have one in the back there. How, how would you say your trauma and brain injury has uh, affected your, your art? Um, it hasn't affected the who I am inside, but it has made it, in the early days, it made it really difficult for me to be able to write, to get it on paper, and to perform. So I made, I created, it made it difficult. So I created my own sub-language. So when I look at my, my cell phone, it used to be my Palm Pilot, that sub-language allows me to see the equivalent of three pages in one. Because contrary to what it looks like, I have a, I have a problematic short-term memory. I go to the bank with the money in my hand if I get to go to the bank, so I give it to Cindy after a month of messing things up. So I've learned, but I've learned um, tons of compensating skills. And what I've learned with writing, and this is the key part, and this, if you've never had any injury or illness, this is the key thing to make an artist an artist. When you write or you put something together, if it doesn't feel right or it doesn't have your walking motion or your driving motion or feel like a movie and you're working it, you're working it too hard. <clears throat> um, I had to, at all times, jot down every little idea I had for fear that I would lose it. What I realized is I never forget anything. The problem is I don't filter it. So I have a um, portable tape machine, a portable uh, recorder. I have sticky notes. I have my cell phone. I have, you know, I have my laptop. I have a, um, uh, what do you call it, a tablet. I send myself text messages. I'll write down anything anywhere that reminds me or gets my information together, even if it makes absolutely no sense, which most of it makes no sense. But um, it made it really difficult, and I created my own way of doing things, and one day I realized it works. <laughs> sure. I'm not shy. There we go. Yes. Um, do you, 
Oh, you go ahead. You go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I'm both wrong. No, you go ahead. Um, do you channel at all? Say that again, please. Do you channel? Um, I don't particularly channel, but I see things that others don't. I get, I hear voices that others don't. And though I've spoke to people about them, they have proven, they've said, what are you, crazy? They've proven to be correct. Um, <clears throat> I feel what other people feel sometimes, even if it's someone I don't know, which is odd because you have to know when not to say anything. But um, I have that sixth, seventh, and eighth sense about things. Um, the best example is the 21 Guns poem. <clears throat> I have never been in the military. I have no children in the military, no personal friends, and though our parents may have been in the military, I have no negative fallout in any of my circles from the military. I wrote that from what I feel. And after I wrote it, I researched it, I cried my eyes out, researched it to make sure everything I'm saying is true. And then it took forever to perform it without crying because I could feel it. Um, that six, that six, thank you, that six, seventh, and eighth sense is strange. But I embrace it. It's it's who I am. Thank you. All right. Since, <laughs> since Ken was kind, okay. also with this bit, we'll do one more. Just how you how do you remember <coughs> uh, all of these poems? Um, most important thing, and this goes back to the fr the first question as well. Um, I don't write for the sake of writing. Um, one of my very well esteemed poetry friends, you wrote that to perform it. I said, no, I can't do that. I write what I feel. I put it together. And if it doesn't, I call it, if it doesn't have that walking flow, it doesn't stick in my brain, I don't see it as an image or a movie, something's wrong. And I don't write in words, by the way. I write an image. And then I find the words, I, I see things. I see, you know, I, the feelings that come to me in images and I know that there are these things going on, I make little notes. But to remember it, I have to feel it and see it. So as I'm putting it together, if that's so much work, I stop because there's no way I'm going to perform that. I can't even get the words on the paper. So. So more questions during intermission. Yes. There's an email in the back. One more hand, please. For Richard. Thank you. On January 19th, in the year 1808, a man named Lysander was born on a farm near Athol went on to become the freest of the free thinkers of his day. His book, No Treason, promoted the ideal of freedom to refrain. Regarding contracts and constitutions, let them who sign it abide it. Another book titled, Vices Are Not Crimes, pierced the very heart of justice postulating, where there's no victim, there's no need for judgment. Indeed, he challenged the government itself by forming his own mail delivery service, promising to be more reliable and thrifty. When he was gaining too great a share of the market, government passed a law of exclusivity, appointing Uncle Sam as sole legal letter carrier in the U.S. of A. Lysander sued, but was denied his due. Yet continued other pursuits, including abolitionism and anti-despotism. Lysander's 79 years on the planet jibed with that popular refrain, you go your way, I'll go mine. And upon his grave is etched his place in history, champion of liberty. On January 19th, in the year 1809, a man named Edgar was born in Boston, who became a renegade writer, scoffed at by the literati of his day who preached the role of literature is to educate and enlighten whereas Edgar chose to frighten his readers with tap, tap, tapping poetry bringing a chilling meter to one's dreams and direful stories making one feel 
tarred and feathered with disquieting vibes that won't fly off, no matter how much one shudders. Rumors of his turning to the green muse for inspiration merely add to his anomalism. Failing to phase his devotees, who continue to absorb those resonant narratives with predestined worst fear endings that only end on the page, never in one's imagination, where the beating of that telltale heart can still be heard on many a dreary night. Now it's curious how two such beings born on the same date, one year apart, but turn out to be such controversial individualists. However, the astrologers all nod in agreement that one's deportment is determined by the alignment of the planets on one's day of delivery. But you can include me among those skeptics who say, poppycock, it's merely coincidence. So when, on January 19th, over a century later, a girl named Janice is born in Dallas, <coughs> grows up to be a free spirit, flaunting her vices, all the while screaming, take another little piece of my heart. I don't pay it any mind whatsoever. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>